Um, at first, I would like uh, to have a short explanation from Mr. Walsh about Walsh. Yeah. Walsh, Walsh. Sorry. No, sorry no problem. Uh, about the keynote speech you did today, this clear distinction between ICT4D and ICTD. If you could explain that once more for okay. the viewers who were not there today. Okay. Well, the distinction I was making there is not a particularly new distinction, but it's the distinction between the use of ICT in developing countries. And I gave the example of India, uh, where um, ICT in developing countries means technology that's developed and used in India. But if you say, take the uh, IT sector in India, the uh, successful uh, software and other forms of export sector, they're using technology and using technology in a very sophisticated way. So in that sense, that's ICT in a developing country. Is it for development? Well, that's another matter because for development implies normally some sort of focus on disadvantaged people or others who need to be uh, their living standards to be raised or other forms of development to be pursued and that does uh, money into the software export sector help that form of development? Well that's not clear, it's something we could discuss but certainly the distinction is therefore ICT for development ought to theorise or discuss what is meant by development and in what ways particular projects or particular uses of technology affect development, not just take place in developing countries in that sense. Okay, thank you very much. Now, Mr. Abraham. Yes, uh, I, I was quite um, intrigued by your description of the current global systems mm. as unsustainable. But within the context of ICTs, could you please just uh, say a little... Unsustainable about? meaning... Unsustainable in the sense that there's a lot of equality, mm. and in the context of ICTs, could this equality be sustained, or do we see an opportunity to shift? Mm. So you're saying that um, the structural inequity, as I sometimes call it, which exists in the world, in other words, it's not just an inequity between different life advantages of different people, but it's also structured in the sense that it's very hard to break out of that. Uh, that therefore people who uh, have children and they're born in very disadvantaged areas are not able to provide adequate education, adequate health, uh, adequate uh, employment opportunities, and thus those children reproduce those cycles of poverty. Now, uh, certainly one thing which I think many of us would support is trying to address that sort of issue. I think one of the points I was making in the conference talk is that I do believe technology can potentially have a role to play in that, whether we're talking about mobile technologies or other forms of technology, but not on its own. Mobile phones don't produce development if there aren't shifts in attitudes, political attitudes, political processes, commitment, uh, people being prepared to recognise these as important issues and to take the appropriate actions. So that, for me, as I think I said in the talk, there's, there's no silver bullet, there's no technology that delivers development just on its own. We also need to address all these other contextual factors at the same time as technology, and then perhaps we can have interventions that are effective. And one example I gave was the health sector, where I think effective improvement in health information systems, for example, the collection and, and use of health data can be valuable, but it needs to be uh, added to uh, education processes for health staff at all levels, it needs to uh, involve shifts in the form, the way institutions operate in such a way that health data is used effectively, it involves change political processes so that resources are committed to the sector to try to benefit uh, poor people in terms of their health care. So the health information systems, whilst valuable, are only one part of this broader set of initiatives that we need to take in particular areas in order to have some chance of managing to achieve some uh, significant uh, development gains, in this case in, in, uh, in, in health for the poor, uh, just one example. I think you also instigated a certain level of paradigm shift when you suggested that uh, at the moment the way we view development is in a comparative uh, framework where we say uh, 
poor countries in relation to development mm. developed countries mm. like mm. the mm. USA mm. and you counter this kind of thinking by saying that you don't think mm. that countries like the USA are developed at all mm. could you could you just uh, <laughs> clarify on this yeah. uh, paradigm yes. that, that I'd, I'd like to just qualify the words there I think yeah. what I was saying was that countries such as the UK, uh, the US, France, whatever, yeah. are, of, of course, have some elements that we all recognize. Uh, for example, clean water is, is one element, and I think we're all happy with that. that and, you know, uh, nevertheless, the view that in that sense we're developed countries implies some final state of arriving at, at some end goal, which I think is wholly unacceptable. Western countries, including the ones I've just mentioned, have all sorts of development issues. Everything from uh, social problems, alcoholism, obesity, uh, uh, child pornography, etc., uh, etc. Et I mean, you, the list is endless. To suggest that these countries, including the one we're currently sitting in, are developed, seem, as I said in my talk, can only, I can only interpret it ironically. I mean, it, uh, surely someone is being ironic if they're saying that this is a developed country. So I don't accept that definition. And I think it also implies an asymmetry of that the developing countries are therefore full of people who are underdeveloped, whereas the rich countries are full of people who are developed. And I totally reject that. If one is operating in any community in the world, whether developing or developed countries, one meets people of different levels of personal development. One can meet an admirable person who is a sweeper in, a, in India. One can meet, on, in contrast, an executive of a major corporation who is an, uh, a person who's making uh, an inadequate uh, personal set of developments. In other words, I, I don't think we should a priori assign people uh, to these categories as if all these people in developing countries are under Paris, yeah. exactly are all underdeveloped, whereas all these people in developed countries are are fine because they have arrived at that goal. And I think we the language itself is unfortunate in that sense. Uh, Surely we're all developing, as both as individuals, communities, societies, and we ought to undertake that commitment together and, uh, and, and not see it as some sort of division, where if, as I said, uh, this implicit view of development that, that, that um, you know, someone from Africa, India, or uh, Asia, or Latin America, if they tried, tried hard enough, could become a good American yeah. or a good English person or whatever, I, ac I don't accept that view of development. But the implications of what you're saying are quite, I think, intense for current uh, development work because a lot of the development that we see, development that we see or development descriptions that that we see and read uh, are based on this comparative yes, they uh, are. ideology. Yes, they are. I think that's absolutely so, right. So you are, uh, are basically instigating perhaps. A new, a new way of, of seeing these things. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure about a new way of seeing things. I'm not sure I go that far. <laughs> or a new definition for development, perhaps, yes. that I is mean, beyond yeah. this comparative state? I'd, I'd, I haven't fully formed these ideas at all. They, they however, come from significant experience of living in, in communities in so-called developing countries. So they're based on experience? Uh, I think there is a large experiential uh, element to it. Um, I, my first experience was living for a year in, in, in Mindanao in the southern Philippines in 1966 to 67, which is, what, 44 years ago. And I lived in a very poor community. And of course, what I observed in that very poor community was that people were much the same as people in any other community in that sense. There were nice people and less nice people, and there was, there was politics and there was social structure. There was certainly a lot of warmth and welcome to me. And ironically, being a poor community, it was one community where you could leave all your possessions lying around and nobody ever stole anything, because of course the social norms were very strong, etc. Therefore, the, you know, having spent a year in that community, it's, it's impossible to come away and categorize poor people as being in some sense inferior to people that operate in, say, a Western country, etc. Now, that experience has been reproduced many times over the years in all sorts of other environments. I lived in Kenya for four years, and I've worked in many other places. And, and my experience remains the same, that the a priori, one is not possible to say anything about an individual Indian or an individual 
uh, Peruvian or whatever, one needs to experience that and experience them and where they are and where their community is. And therefore, if we're trying to use technology to benefit those communities, then we need to have some a deeper understanding of where they are now and what sort of interventions might be appropriate. And most of that ought to come from within, in that sense, from within the communities. As an outsider, I think maybe sometimes one can have a useful catalytic role. I also, as an academic, think that ideas are very important. The view that ideas are things that are not practical seems to me a big mistake, uh, in the sense that ideas are, are transforming. Uh, ideas can change the world. And, and, and I think we should not, therefore, see academic ideas as being somehow divorced from the real world. I think they can actually inspire people in the real world. So I think that should be our goal, as one of our goals as an academic, is to create ideas that are inspirational, in that sense. Interesting. Um, do you feel that the current development of the field of ICT4D reflects these development, uh, these thoughts of yours in, in any way? Or? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that this particular conference, this particular community is very encouraging, I think. Uh, people have talked about multidisciplinary work for years, this conference is a good example of it in reality. I mean, I personally know anthropologists, political scientists, uh, development studies people, information science people, information systems people, etc. I've missed out some categories, no doubt. <laughs> but I think that's extremely valuable, and I think the debates, therefore, about, for example, the meaning of development, are much better conducted in that broader community than they are taking place individually within a given field, such as information system, or even development studies. In other words, I don't think we should allow development studies to get away with the view that we are the people who know about development. I, I think it's... I think. That, that's great, and I think it's great to have people working in that area, but I think that they ought to work with other disciplines, and I think many development studies people would agree with that entirely. So there's perhaps opportunities for this new field to do some things that it's not possible for the more uh, uh, older established fields to do. One of the questions in my session this morning was about computer science and the way it's difficult for people within computer science to get away from the paradigms of the discipline that place emphasis on certain types of publications, certain types of journals, etc. Whereas perhaps this new uh, field has the opportunity to create some new norms as to what is good behaviour, what is uh, you know, valuable work, etc. Including, for example, some issues about practitioner, um, uh, academic interchange, etc. that were raised this morning. So I think this conference is a good example of a, an optimistic view that one can take that perhaps this this area can make a, a, a significant contribution. Uh, uh, and so I welcome it. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? And you said in the beginning that the ICTs are not uh, the silver bullet of, of, of overcoming all these problems, of course, but mm. do you think that this, um, this gap you were describing of the, the notion of some, some countries being less developed and some mm. more, uh, that is now being, it's now easier to be bridged because anybody in the world can write any CEO in the world an email personally yeah. that, hey, hi, here I am, that's my idea. Yeah. Do you yeah. think that's, that's kind of a romantic notion or do you yeah, think it's, it's happening? A, yeah, well, I would say it is slightly romantic in the sense that, you know, the ordinary person, for example, in Africa does not have uh, an access. email address <laughs> or access to the internet. So in that sense, Absolutely. they are not uh, part of this, you know, worldwide community. Also, as you know, if you send a, an email to a CEO, a CEO doesn't read it anyway because they have a staff who actually whose job it is to filter out those communications. So the view that the technology by itself will enable the flattening of hierarchies, I think, is a little romantic. However, having said that, I think technologies such as mobile, for example, undoubtedly are the first technology that I'm aware of which really quite poor people around the world are purchasing themselves out of their own money because they perceive that there is some value in this technology. Now, I think that's a very important phenomenon. It's a different phenomenon than previously. Many of the other exercises have been top-down things. If you take, take telecenters, you know, t nothing wrong with telecenters per se. I'm not saying that all things about telecenters are poor, but, but telecenters have typically been introduced top-down. 
were brought in like that were not asked for by the local communities. They were very much brought in by others, whether, you know, with good intentions, etc. Whereas the mobile phenomenon is particularly interesting in terms of that sort of bottom up. And rather than sending a text or an email necessarily, undoubtedly they are enabling some forms of communication that undoubtedly were not there previously. The MPs, for example, being also some form of, of money service, etc. So I think these technologies do have, uh, such as mobile, do have enormous potential, but I think they do need to be accompanied with serious efforts, as I said earlier, to address some of the other barriers that, that, that exist. So health, an area I'm very interested in, mobiles are not the answer, although they can be part of an approach to improving healthcare for the poor in that sense. Okay, I have a lot of questions still, but I'll ask this particular question. What is the world you want to see? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can answer that. <laughs> you must have an idea. Your own theory of what, what kind of a world you want to see. And I'm very interested to see it. Yeah, I, I don't know about that I, I, uh, I, I don't think I, I deal very easily in, in, in end states in some sort of senses. In other words, some sort of utopia of where we're trying to get. I think what I'm more interested in is processes more interested in can we develop processes that enable things to happen that currently are not happening. For example, the voice of the poor, I don't think, is one that is adequately heard. So we need to amplify it. So I think we need to think of ways in which we can try to amplify that, enable people to express themselves, to, to bring the knowledge that they have to the table. You know, the, the, the view that development, ought to, for example, ought to be something that is decided on by bodies such as the World Bank or whoever, and that therefore it ought to be then given to these people and who ought to be thankful for it, is a view that I think is unacceptable. I think the, the poor are well aware of changes they want in their own lives, and we ought to be trying to amplify those voices in such a way that those they can join the debates, and it follows your point to a large extent. It's not that it necessarily makes everything wonderful overnight, but surely it then brings these voices to bear, which we don't typically see, for example, even through the conventional media. The portrayal, for example, of, of, of Africa in the media is often you know, a continent of, of famines and wars and strife, and we don't see this, this other side of people trying to lead decent lives under difficult conditions in a thoughtful way and trying to protect their families and all the other things that normal people do throughout the world. And we don't, we don't see that side of it. Those voices are not heard. So how can we think of ways, how can we develop ways? It's just one example of a process, the sort of process I would like to see. Uh, I'd like to see also the challenges to hierarchies. Yes. Our world is too hierarchical in my view. Uh, hierarchies are... Uh, I understand why they arose in bureaucratic organisations, yeah. our Weber and all of that, but nevertheless I think it's... It, it, Unsustainable. It, it, well, I think it's, it's wholly unacceptable in many instances, and the, one of the things one has to try to do, for example in health systems, is to try to, to some extent, weaken some of those hierarchies, so that, again, the voices of some of the people at the at the sharp end in, in, in the delivery of healthcare are heard and that health isn't perceived as being something whereby the people at the top dish out orders which come down through the system but there's actually no uh, feedback the other way. So I, mean, I think a challenge to existing organisational structures is another form of process change that I'd like to see to some eventual state, well, I don't know. Uh, we all have a very simple eventual state, yes. which is death, but in the meantime, <laughs> we can actually try to do some small do things, things to develop ourselves yes. and maybe to make a contribution to that for others, yes. Um, I also have another personal question. Sure. Um, as I'm a rather young person and I would like to engage myself actually in bettering the world in any way, yeah. um, I sometimes feel like um, I just don't know enough of the consequences of my actions so that I um, can, you yeah. know, contribute anywhere um, yeah, yeah. with making sense. So would you rather say yeah, I, yeah. you know, as a person, I mean, nobody knows everything, of course, yeah, yeah. but you can still study yeah. more so yeah. that the yeah. side effects are lessened. But Yeah, no, I think that's a very nice question. I, I have thought about that particular question. And uh, my response is to say that we never know the consequences of our our actions. So you give, I give a talk this morning, you know, what sort of consequences, I can't measure it. I, d I don't know, 
you know, the way it affects other people. If I take any action, I'm not sure about the consequences of that action, no matter how much one is red and no matter how many grey hairs you have, you, don't, you can't do that prediction. The question is, are you trying hard enough? Mm -hmm. You know, that it, it's to do with personal process, isn't it? Are you trying hard enough by trying your best to, to read things and, and to understand things, trying your best to listen to what others are saying so that you actually are learning from them? And then, once you've done that, then taking action in a particular context, you can only take the, the best action that you perceive at that point in time with your current knowledge you can't get it right, I mean, because someone then has to define what's meant by right, and that's contentious. So for me, it's, it's, not, it's a matter of, of are you trying to learn? You know, for example, if you give a talk, for people, it's just an illustration since we're talking about the talk, you know, people are very kind and say pleasant things sometimes, and that's good, but you also ought to try to be looking, for, you know, criticism is more valuable than praise. <laughs> if people praise you, it's all very well, but if, if you know, if you get a critique of your work or your critique of your ideas, that's the time to be listening really carefully because that's the time at which you start to learn. And that applies as much to me as it applies to you, regardless of age. Because if you, you know, you reach a point, in fact, some people talk about age, well, the body ages, but the, where, where your mind ages is if you stop trying to learn, if you stop trying to listen. And particularly if you're operating in these domains like technology, you know, I mean, how could you possibly remain up to date in just that field if you don't make some effort to learn and to listen? Yeah. Uh, two of my children actually are, um, are techies, they're, they're proper real ones. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I learn lots of technology from them, you know, because I, I try to learn from them so that I don't have come across, you know, a danger when you're older as being somebody who knows nothing about technology. So, you try to, so I need to learn the same way yeah. as you do. Yeah. Of course, trying to pick what it is that you're deficient in and to try and strengthen that is always a, a task for all of us, isn't it? Uh, a sort of trying to think carefully about which areas of one's own endeavour one is trying to strengthen. But then from that, one can't be always obsessed about the consequences because they're, they're very hard to fathom. One needs to just then take action with the best, one hopes the best of intentions. I hope that that's positive. Thank you very much. <laughs> Encouraging okay. words. Okay.